The recent political storm over Member of Parliament Mahua Moitra's comments on Kali soon followed by another political controversy around a weekly magazine publishing on its cover a 200-year-old Kangada painting of Kali and Shiva brought the national attention on the many varied ways in which the goddess is imagined, understood, and worshipped across the subcontinent. To some, she is a loving mother. To some, a ferocious warrior goddess. She is associated with cremation grounds and believed to symbolize death. And yet she also represents creation of life and the universe. Some believe she is the manifestation of the ultimate reality, the Brahman. And then there are those who see in her a rule-breaking feminist icon. Even the ancient texts don't seem to agree. At one end, we are told that she emerged from Shiva to slay the demons. And on the other, she's herself Adi Shakti, the supreme power. Literature tells us that she's timeless and formless, yet the visual depictions of her form have evoked awe, horror, and reverence among millions for centuries. While in many parts of India, her worship still involves liquor or meat or fish or blood, to vast swaths of Indians unaware of this, even the mention of such substances in association with the Devi is nothing less than sacrilege. Today, we have invited one of the most knowledgeable scholars of Indian mythology to help us unravel the perplexing iconography, legends, and practices associated with the ever more intriguing goddess Kali. By way of introduction, if there is still anyone left in India who hasn't heard of Devdutt Patnaik, he writes on the relevance of mythology in modern times. He's the author of numerous books on sacred stories, symbols, and rituals. Some of these include Myth, Mithya, a handbook of Indian mythology, Jaya, an illustrated retelling of the Mahabharata, and Sita, an illustrated retelling of the Ramayana and Mai Gita. David, welcome to Argumentative Indians. It's really an honor to have you with us. Um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I hope I'm audible and clear. Perfectly, sir. So, so as I've just lay, laid out the, the stage for you, Kali's brought with contradictions for a layman like me. So help me like unravel, help me piece it together. How, what is the right form of understanding? And if there is a right form, so let's go on a journey. So let's imagine a, a white man coming to India for the first time in the 15th, 16th century. Um, he comes from a tradition which says um, there is only one God and that God is male. And he has seen this God in the Sistine Chapel visualizes an old man. His understanding of God is someone uh, who is born on earth also, but through a virgin mother. And the image of the virgin mother is always clothed and dressed in white and blue. His image of divinity is very masculine. And the idea of God communicated to human is also coming through male prophets. Now that's the world he's coming from. And he suddenly enters a country where he sees people visualizing God in different forms, some plants, some animals, some rocks, some rivers, male, female. Um, there are celibate holy men. There are wild goddesses dancing. Um, there are theatrical performances. Um, if somebody asks what is God, they don't really understand what they are explaining. So it's a very different world they come from, right? And this colonial view of the world and one thing which really shocked them was the worship of a woman a woman who is dark a woman who is naked and wild and absolutely in control and power this image was complete opposite of what they had ever seen because it was feminine it was dark remember they are white people so everything dark was seen as dark and devilish and woman they are a patriarchal culture. They suddenly see women and powerful women. Remember, this is before feminism as an idea ever took off. So this idea of a powerful woman 
uh, in a female form associated with uh, very violent imagery, but looking very calm and composed and not necessarily being violent. Um, and that they couldn't make sense of it. And it terrified them and shocked them. It, uh, the goddess was associated with all kinds of practices that disturbed them. And they said that this is something very strange and weird and we must, uh, uh, this is to be condemned and this is savage behavior. So if you read colonial writings, um, they had these ideas of uh, thuggies, of criminals who would worship this goddess and sacrifice men and women to her, highway robbers who would kill and garrote people on the road in the name of this goddess called Kali. And Kali was this wild goddess. And you find this idea, which is there in the 19th century, also appearing in films like um, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom done by Steven Spielberg, a very orientalist image which saw Kali as the drinker of blood and the mother of criminals and all kinds of very negative feelings. It was really shocking. It was banned in India. It was a film was not allowed. But you see, even educated people like Steven Spielberg who talk about anti-Semitism have no problem presenting Hinduism in this negative light. And it's very strange that in 21st century India, many Indians have the colonial gaze and they can't handle a dark, powerful woman figure. And that's very tragic. We are still colonized, that women are seen as less powerful. The idea of a dark, powerful goddess who does not want to wear clothes and is uh, behaving in a way that doesn't suit a patriarch is rather than celebrated as proto-feminism in India, is seen as something we should be ashamed of. And uh, Indians, especially many of those Indians who live abroad, are ashamed of this image because they don't know how to deal with this imagery. And the shame is sort of percolating without realizing and trying to understand a goddess who represents an idea that is far ahead of its times. I mean, feminism in, the, in, the, in America today, women are being denied rights over their own bodies. Right, America, the Statue of Liberty welcoming you. But even the woman, the Statue of Liberty, the Lady of Liberty, if she were to be get pregnant today, may not be allowed to decide what she has to do with her body. And that's what the West is. And these primitive colonial ideas still exist in India because we're still colonized, right? We, we may be independent for 75 years, but mentally, many Indians uh, shaped by the Western discourse are embarrassed by the goddess Kali and everything that she represents and the culture that comes from it. So, you know, it's a kind of a self-hatred for India of Indians because you know, they're still colonized and that's unfortunate. And that's what Kali is about. So it reminds us about an India that we have to understand and it's different India, not the India that you would, that makes sense to a man who wants to control women. I agree with you. Like obviously, the the colonial from the colonial gaze, the a lot of the imagery around Kali must have horrified them, must have shocked them, and must have, and they probably found a lot of this vulgar, and which probably their objections were not very dissimilar from the outrage that we saw recently when a centuries-old painting came on the cover of a magazine, and so many people were outraged to see a naked Kali st stepping on top of a naked Shiva which actually is nothing new in India. It has been there for centuries, if not millennia. But my question is actually, it's, it's easy to see the connection with the, the Europeans, the colonizers, and that's... But what was this acceptable across India even before the British came or in pre-modern times? What, were, were this kind of, was this kind of imagery commonplace? And what was a lot of the practices associated with the goddess were they mainstream in pre-modern times? You see, we must be careful with modern ideas and traditional ideas. There were no magazines in ancient India, right? Uh, I don't know which magazine you're talking about, so I can't comment on it. Yeah. But um, there were no magazines. And magazine has a market and a target and a purpose. Uh, a uh, Kali image appearing on an Indian magazine is very different from an Mac appearing in a American magazine. It is very different. A Kali image appearing in a fashion magazine is very different from a Kali image appearing in a religious literature. A Kali magazine appearing in Bengal in Bengali in a local newspaper 
is very different from something which happens, say, in a, a New York suburb or New Jersey or uh, let's say Latin America or in Africa. So it's not the same thing. Communication is a complex thing. Who do you communicate? What do you communicate? How do you communicate? Why do you communicate? Um, you know, um, it has many meanings. I can um, look at the symbol of Makkah and Kaaba in Mecca, but is it okay to show it on a T-shirt? Is it okay to show the image of the Kaaba in, let's say, wallpaper? Um, is it okay to show the image of the Virgin Mary on a toilet seat? So your point is that the purpose of the depiction probably is may have been more of the cause of an outrage. We don't know. I don't, as I said, I don't know the magazine, but we, I will always be careful before trying to universalize things that you should not be outraged or you should be outraged. The question is, we have to ask ourselves these fundamental questions. Are we, uh, you know, we are now living in times where everybody seems to be oversensitive about everything. We're also having time where freedom of speech has become about abuse, right? And this is what Kali is trying to demonstrate. Kali is trying to demonstrate our ability to communicate. That's why she shows the tongue, right? Why is the tongue so important? Yeah, I was going to get to that. That was like my. Thing, they always tell you control your tongue, control your tongue. The all quarrels come from the tongue, and the most important tantric ritual is what is known as Khechari Mudra, where you have to turn your tongue and touch your palate and meditate for a long time, which means you can't speak. People give it magical meaning, but it basically means holding back your tongue for hours at end, which means you do you're not able to talk, you're not able to communicate, and I think it's a reminder of Kali's tongue. So communication, what is communication? What you say and what you receive. On one side is the person who believes freedom of speech means freedom to abuse. On the other side, you have the person who says, I have the right to get outraged and upset and sensitive over even an innocuous comment. I will misread and misread everything and get outraged at no matter what you say until you're completely silenced. So on both sides of communication, you have uh, people who have manipulative powers, the person who speaks and the person who listens. And that's what Kali is drawing your attention to with her tongue sticking out because she sees through the game. She knows that the person who says, I want freedom of speech really wants the freedom to disrespect. And the person who says that I, um, you know, I don't, I, I, um, I am emotionally, uh, you know, traumatized by this communication is also a mischievous person because anything can upset people, right? Anything. I can get upset with a simple poetry. Anything you do can upset me. Um, the fact that you wear a sari can upset me. The fact that you don't wear a sari, you wear a bikini can upset me. The fact that you can... Now, bikini worn in a beach is very different from bikini worn, say, on the main road, right? A sari worn in an Indian ecosystem is very different from a sari worn in a orthodox um, Jewish neighborhood, Right. So we have to be very careful. This idea of where you speak, what you speak, with whom you speak, for whom you speak, this is lost in today's world. We are saying that everything can be said everywhere. And this is what Kali is laughing at because her images are not found everywhere. Her images are restricted to certain spaces. It's very clear. Do you have the intellectual capability of understanding it? Not everybody's so smart, right? And we would like to believe in this world of equality where everybody is smart, but not everybody. You have to take Diksha before you can understand Kali. Not everybody is allowed to understand Kali. It's not a monotheistic religion. Hinduism is not, everybody has to understand everything. No, there are different people with different needs, different capabilities, different abilities. Um, you know, what someone with a colonial mindset, somebody who's an NRI will not understand the same thing that say a village person in India will understand. Somebody raised in New York cannot have the same understanding as someone raised in Bhagalpur or someone raised in Raipur. Everybody will have a different understanding. And so you have to decide, will they have the intellectual and emotional wherewithal to understand Kali before you comment? You can't, that's why books are very powerful. Because book you have to pick up and read, very different from a magazine cover that you can't, not see, right? That is being projected onto you. 
So one has to be very careful with communication and communication is something that um, is the essence of Hindu thought and uh, you know Saraswati is worshipped and Kali is a form of Saraswati in tradition. So that's very interesting actually. So I'm just thinking like before the age of mass media and social media, like you said, like certain imagery of Kali or of any god for that matter, evolved in a certain context and, and same applies to the religious practices. But the others are told, told that, oh, in that temple over there, whiskey is offered to the Kali. Or in that temple, meat is offered to the Kali and people are shocked. But they don't have the entire context how that practice came about or when the goddess is worshipped as, let's say, Chinnamasta and you see this shocking image of the goddess with her uh, beheaded, with her head in her own hand, with blood all over. It out of context is shocking and and forget the outsiders, even to many Indians, I'm sure they'll be like, how can that be a mother, a loving mother? That doesn't make sense. How do you worship that? And because it's been pulled out of its tantric traditions or wherever it actually was born and evolved. And this is something that we are just learning to deal with because now we live in an age where every image is available instantly online on everyone's phones. And we just don't know how to deal with this kind of a reality, how to sort of put these things in context. Yes. You see, that's so that the, the thing is, you know, the, we assumed that the Western discourse is a modern discourse and will make us a better world. But, you know, Western thought is very primitive. And what we call Western thought, uh, you know, it's uh, very linear, very lack of diversity, lack of equality. They don't understand these words. They use these words randomly. I see all these people talking about diversity and I'm in universities and in American universities. too. it's gone completely crazy. People who consider themselves the left wing has gone mad. The right wing has gone mad. And those ideas are coming into India and India is not giving its and Indians also don't know their own ideas. Right. We we most Indians do not understand the scriptures. They don't they've not spent time reading the scriptures, looking at the images, trying to understand. They just make these bold statements. India was very modern in 5000 years ago. I said, what does it mean? You know, what does it mean? <laughs> you can't use these crazy sentences like that. Um, you know, most of our texts are written by Brahmin men. Brahmin men don't write about the whole world. They write about their little world. So that little world that they inhabit. So the Brahmin writings are written by Brahmin. And if I, I always tell people, please read, when you're reading a book, ask a little bit about the author. Who is this author? When you read, uh, you know, when you read Mahabharat, they'll tell you the background story of Vyas, who has written the story. Why? It is a, it's called what today we call post-structuralism. Always know the background of the author who is telling you the story. So you are able to contextualize where he's coming from. He's not giving you some full gyan. So uh, if a celibate man is giving you gyan on sex, you don't take him seriously, right? Because he's never had sex in his life. If a, person, if a celibate man says, I do not talk to women, I don't touch women, and but I'm going to tell you how to have sex, then you're like, hmm. This is fantasy happening. This is not. So your point is that a lot of these texts were written by like elite privileged group. They were part of like, and they had certain motivations to write this. There was a certain audience to whom they were writing these, a lot of the ancient Sanskrit texts. And they were themselves, they had a reality, which was not the lived reality of the vast majority of Indian people at the time. No, see, they were writing for their audiences. Right. We think they were writing for other audiences. For other audiences. It's our problem. They were not like, for example, what we are calling these words like elite and privileged. In the village, someone who does not know to read and write also has knowledge and he's transmitting that knowledge to his community through non letters like it's every communication and all knowledge don't come in the form of texts they can be in the form of images they can be form of ritual they can be in the form of symbols they can be in the form of artwork they can be in the form of performance they can be in the form of storytelling so knowledge is being transmitted in different forms we have privileged the text we have privileged sanskrit we think sanskrit is the source of all knowledge sanskrit doesn't say so you know some very badly educated men think so. Knowledge has no language. Knowledge has no form. It will come in Sanskrit. It will come in words. It will come in images. Kali is an image which is talking to you without using words. So it's art. The art communicates to you without using words, without using vocabulary, without using grammar. That person who must have created the Kali image need not be literate. He is a, he's very wise, but he's communicating using non-literal forms of communication. 
it is something that we don't understand. We have privileged language. We have privileged words. I can communicate with, you know, on a, when you want to impress a girl on a date, you don't have to say anything, right? You can just by the way you listen, the way you. And that might be a factor of like these colonizers, the culture from which they came, scripture was prominent, was actually primary. And the text, they were, they, have, they were taught in a tradition where text was supreme with the Bible or other texts. And they applied the same lens on India, which is basically all they knew. So it's, it's understandable, but now we need to find our own way of understanding our own culture, which has to go be far beyond the foreign lens. Traditional India did not give a lot of importance to Brahmins. Right. The British gave a lot of importance to Brahmins. Traditional India said Brahmins is one community for one work, but you have other communities for different works. But the British came and said, oh, the priestly class must be the most important people. They just decided and they decided to privilege the Brahmins over others. And that has come. Now, in the moment I get privileged, why will I let it go? I'm not going to let it go. I am going to say, yeah, 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 I'm the most important person in the world. And you're like, no. But that's, that's a very provocative thing you just said. I've, I'm really surprised and I would love to dive deeper, but I want to come back to the main topic. So you earlier we were talking, you said Kali's it, it comes through the images, the images we don't even know how old they are. In the text, we know that Kali first, we find the first mention in the text in the Devi Mahamatmya. But the images, we don't know how back, far back they go. And people had communicated already a lot about Kali through these images. So we so know to to when these images appeared. We know that they become uh, around 500 AD. They start getting mainstreamed in Sanskrit narratives. And we know that the Chamunda images, which is a kind of a proto-Kali, um, is emerging around 600 AD, 700 AD. You find these images in Odisha, Bhubaneswar. They're the Chamunda images. Can just, anybody can just Google Chamunda. It's not the classical Kali image with the tongue sticking out and Shiva anywhere in the picture. But Shiva, it's part of the Shaivite artwork. She is emaciated. She's dark. She's very, um, she is like sort of as if a rotting flesh. She's sitting on a pile of dead bodies and she's surrounded by ghosts and dogs and scorpions and lions and lots of weapons in her hand and skulls in her hand. So clearly uh, uh, symbols associated with death, symbols associated with the uh, battlefield. That is where she was. And this goddess is there in Tamil literature, similar goddess called Khotravai, which is found in Sangam literature. And she is associated with the wilderness and the desolate wilderness and the battlefields because remember ancient and medieval India was a very violent place people would fight battles and the body would lie in the battlefield what will happen they get they start rotting and at night you'll have these smells of dogs and cats and wolves and vultures going there and people would get scared to go at night to the battlefield where let's say hundreds of bodies are lying and they would say the goddess Kotravai has come and that is where the Chamunda imagery emer emerges. And then the body is going to be taken and taken to a funeral place where it's going to be burned. And the bodies are piled up. Just visualize what I'm saying. And they'll say, oh, this is the goddess Niritti. Niritti is the goddess of decay, which is associated with the battle, with the cremation ground. So these ideas are there. They're sort of forming themselves. And this place, which is associated with death and decay and destruction at one level is feared because this is where the ghosts are there. The pretas are there and the ghosts are associated with Chamunda imagery. And you find this image very well uh, crafted in the ninth century in the Yogini temples, which are found in Odisha, which are found in Madhya Pradesh. So you do find this imagery appearing, not exactly in the Kali form as we know it today, but yes, by the 5th, 6th century, and Tantra has become very powerful. So that is about 1300 years ago, 1400 years ago, these images are definitely part of India. Before that, speculation, you can speculate anything, spaceships also. So, you know, data is not there. We don't have data, but we have data from the 1500 years. The story is there. It's part of literature. You find in Buddhist literature, you have these uh, stories of goddesses who are very powerful, associated with funeral sites, death sites, battlefields, diseases. And they are these powerful, and they are found in Jain literature. You find them in Buddhist literature. They all appear almost simultaneously 1500 years ago. That's a good watermark here. And perhaps they sort of come mainstream. They were always there, but they were not mainstream. All the literature that we have of before, from before this period is really, as I said, Brahminical and very upper elite groups. We are not getting information about 80% of India's population. 
So if when I talk about India's past, I have information of only a small group of people who had access to the written word, who had access to making stone temples and stupas. I don't have access to the words and the thoughts and the ideas of 80% of India's population. So we must keep that in mind. They become mainstream 1500 years ago, for sure. By 1500 years, they have entered in a very big way. Um, you find them in the moment temples start appearing, these goddesses have started appearing. So you can see them in Elora. If you go to Elora, you will find this image of um, the three goddesses. Lakshmi is there, Saraswati is there, um, Durga is there. And then suddenly you have this goddess sitting on a pile of flesh. And that's a frightening image. And that's perhaps a proto-Kali, we can say. Not exactly Kali, but yes, that kind of goddess, which sort of terrifies us. So I'm really curious. I know that now my next question is sort of venturing into the territory of speculation but i'm really curious to know your point of view did the sanskrit literature expand across the other sections of society that these goddesses who were probably worshipped even before made it into the text or it's the same brahmanic brahman people who were writing these texts ex imbibe this form of veneration of the goddess did the goddess reach them or did the Sanskrit expand to other sections of the society? So Sanskrit never expanded. It was always within a small section of society for various reasons, because they were supposed to be the people who were supposed to document this stuff, not for any caste reason to oppress people, which are all these new ways of explaining. They were a community with, associated with a language and that's fine. But they, the people there got exposed to more and more ideas. They were, the Brahmins had from the Vedic period, which was a very insular way the Brahmins were very insular in the Vedic period, but in the post-Vedic period, they sort of travel across from the Gangetic Plains. They come to the south of India, east of India, west of India. We know of migrations that are taking place. They are exposed to new ideas. They are working with kings. Um, they are becoming courtiers. They are getting land grants. They are engaging with more and more people. And I think an idea exchange is taking place. Lots of ideas are changing. New ideas are emerging. Um, so you see the shift from the Vedic Hinduism towards what is called or Puranic Hinduism, where stories become important, characters become important, visuals become important. And the, what I call that from the mantra period, which was very uh, formless, you come to the tantra period where the body becomes important. And this is when uh, alphabets become important, you know, even, even script becomes important. The script starts to appear. Remember, in the Vedic period, nobody wrote it down. So the script appears. Um, the script is associated with a goddess. For example, Adi Shankara's Ishta Devi is called Sharda Devi. And Sharda is the goddess of a script. So a script, so when I'll say the script communicates knowledge, the, we are saying goddess has given me knowledge. So Sharda has given me knowledge. It's a metaphor for the script. So the goddesses start to appear roughly when the tantric culture starts to appear. And basically the goddesses are saying the body is as important as the mind. So uh, the body has become very, very important and the body starts being represented. So it's this engagement of different communities, not like a one-way traffic. It's a two-way traffic of ideas, thoughts. And therefore you find this new idea of tantra emerging where the guru becomes important. And um, you know, the, one of the earliest images I always tell people to see is when you just again, Google uh, Parshurameshwar temple in Odisha um, or some of the Mamalapuram uh, art or the Halebe uh, Pattadakkal eye hole artwork. And you'll find suddenly gods and goddesses talking to each other. First, the female form has appeared with the male form and having conversations. And it's how you see the image. Like, for example, there is an image of, if you go to uh, Madhya Pradesh, some of the oldest images of Varaha. Varaha is a wild boar and holding a goddess on the snout. Now, how do we see this image? We are, we are seeing this image as the wild masculine god is rescuing the goddess. That's the male gaze. But what's actually happening is the goddess is comforting the aggressive, toxic male and saying, calm down, world is not so bad. So it's a conversation between the male and female energy. Yeah, so that's so, the goddess Bhumi, right? You're talking like about Bhumi Devi is standing there, but it's how you see the image. It's not, oh, the big aggressive male is controlling the woman, and the woman is just holding his. If you look carefully, she's very tender and saying, Why are you so aggressive? Why are you so insecure? Calm down. 
you know the goddess is always smiling she's holding a hand and see some of the early images the women are in equal terms she's talking to the goddess uh, the goddess in the vedic period the goddesses don't have a very prominent role but as we move to tantric period tantra period of india the goddesses become far more prominent far more prominent they start becoming uh, they are talking to shiva so shiva who doesn't speak starts to talk because she engages with him so look at the story of uh, kali right in a way kali is related to the goddess uh, who domesticates shiva shiva is the ascetic he says i don't want to be part of this world and the goddess says so what's the point of your knowledge you know what's the point of your knowledge and you know for example uh, i always give this example of buddhism buddhism begins when buddha sees suffering in the world and he begins his journey by abandoning his wife and his child so story begins with the abandoning of a woman he leaves her and goes into the forest to become a hermit but the shiva story begins with the hermit the person who is a hermit who stays in the mountains who's covered with ash but he gets married to the goddess so it's the opposite journey it's the opposite journey of marrying the goddess she's making him acknowledge her needs her desires her wants i want to have a child i want to have a family i want to eat food uh, doesn't my hunger matter okay great you are superb you are powerful you are mahadev you don't have any desires but what about people around you who have desires and the pretas the ghosts there is a chamunda is associated with ghosts who are these ghosts these ghosts are wanting a body because they are ghosts only when they have a body can they perform rituals and get moksha so body is what they want body is in sanskrit is tan from tan comes tantra the body so you can't not so the monks the monks so the yogis the buddhists the jains the yogis they all are like oh body is bad body is bad and the goddess is saying no body is necessary body is necessary and this is the tension of india does the body matter or does the body not matter and this leads to two schools of thought one is called what is called vedanta and vedanta and the other is tantra much later it happens very slowly but tantric school will value the feminine and will give equal importance to the body the vedic school withdraws from the goddess and looks at goddess as maya delusion while in tantra the goddess is shakti power and the converse is she delusion is she power or is power delusion and that's how this conversation starts appearing in india as i said in the post gupta period and this conversation happens in buddhism it happens in jainism in different forms in different ways and they negotiate this very differently you remember buddha uh, buddhism starts 2500 years ago but the first female form equal in buddha stature appears only around 600 ad as tara and tara is another name for kali and that only appears almost a thousand years after buddhism starts so women were not important in buddhism women were not important in jainism in jainism at least the women could become nuns so shra the the shravika or the nun was important in buddhism the nun was important but they were not equal to the male uh, monks they were inferior it is only in tantra that the women sort of in a way it's a, it's not an easy struggle um, it's almost as if a progress to society that women took on these prominent roles or did the women just take prominent roles in mythology but the society they remain Uh, at the same level uh, you wouldn't as- know but you you see most people think civilized society is where women are inferior to men that's news to me well that's, that's what america is doing right right now america is saying women's body belongs to the state and that's a sign of progress the woman's uterus belongs to the government of america doesn't belong to her so this control of women victorian society highly civilized women are inferior what do you call equality of women's rights is a ninth post second world war phenomena right so this idea is seen as anarchic it's anarchy that women right. equal to men is seen in the western world as uncivilized right but from a that's from a patriarchal standpoint i agree with you but the way we think of a um, a civilized society is where people are all equal regardless of their gender sex sexuality etc so in that regard do you, do you think that like there was progress india was in a period of pro- the society was becoming progressive but like one of my question is were the priests in tantra worshiping the devi they did, did we have female priests as well or were it just the goddesses becoming more powerful not the actual women 
So um, first, let's clarify the meaning of the word civilized. There is no progress. Again, this way of thinking that life is a progress is a technological way of thinking. You and I are no different from people who lived a thousand years ago just because we have a cell phone or because we're talking on the internet. Human beings are still the human beings. Our brain size has not increased. You know, we are jealous. Even today, we were jealous a thousand years ago. Okay, sure. shorts contracted the brain size. Yeah. So the, the point is civilization is where you exchange ideas. So globally now, the new definition of civilization is where goods, services, and ideas are exchanged, not controlled by one group, hoarded by one group, but exchanged. So this is the new definition of civilization, which is being used by anthropologists and sociologists around the world. So the colonial definition was, do you know English? Are you having new technology? Do you have electricity? Do you have water? Are you developed in those terms? But now we are realizing that's not what makes us good human beings. What makes us civilization is about, are you a nice person? Do you exchange things? Do you give me, do you enable? Do you, if you oppress, with nuclear technology, then you are not civilized. You're barbaric. You know, if you have 5,000 nuclear warheads, which will destroy the earth 5,000 times, I don't call you civilized. I call you barbaric and stupid. So that is, we have to first understand that. Now let's go to the Indian society. While these images are em emerging, what's happening? There's at another level, India is trying to become, is also becoming patriarchal because where does patriarchy come from? Patriarchy emerges from the idea of property. The idea that uh, you belong to me or I belong to you. The idea of ownership, wherever the idea of property goes, women's rights keep going down. That's what happens around the world. So the moment you say this land belongs to me, it's only a question of time before this land becomes this woman belongs to me. So the, this journey is, and this is Mahabharata explains this very beautifully, where Kunti is asked by her husband, um, you know, uh, I don't have any children. Uh, you know, we can't, I can't have sex with you. What do I do for children? She says, you know what? Once upon a time, you didn't have to get married to have children. You could just go to any man and have children. But then one day, Men came up with the idea of marriage so that fathers can know who their sons are so that the sons can inherit the father's property. So marriage came into the picture when property became important and land. So Kali is talking about a time or her visualization is of a time where women didn't belong to men. She's this idea. That is why it's frightening. The idea that women don't belong to men. This idea is what Kali represents and embodies from ancient times. So when she becomes the wife of, Parv, uh, of Shiva and becomes Gauri, and by the way, today is Hartalika Tej, where the goddess Gauri is worshipped in many parts of India. And tomorrow her son Ganesha will come. So this Gauri, now look at the word Kali, Gauri. Kali means dark and Gauri means radiant and bright. And they are two forms of the same goddess. Kali represents the wild forest, which is not controlled by any person. While Gauri represents the field, the orchard, the garden, which is controlled and domesticated. But who controls her? In the story, she controls herself. She doesn't belong to Shiva. She chooses to domesticate herself and become his wife. She chooses to be a mother. She chooses to be beside him. It's her choice. She chooses to marry him. She asks him to be the husband. So all agency is given to the goddess. So this story of Kali becoming Gauri is about her power. This agency is taken away from the goddess in society. In society, we so you have the Manusmriti saying women belong to men. Now this Manusmriti and the Dharma Shastras are emerging at the same time as the Tantric literature is emerging. So you are finding that these, you know, while we are getting exposed to ideas of women who are talking about nature is free, and there is also another lobby which is saying that, you know, no, 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 women can't have freedom, women can't have freedom. And these two lobbies are fighting each other. And you typically find in upper class elite families, women are controlled far more than in uh, families which don't have property. See, if you have no property, then... You know, women have their own, even they have more freedom, they have more agency, they have more access, they are not bound so much. So you find this, so that's which that's part that's of that's India that's are we talking about? So what also that makes me 
think about is that we think society today is polarized. And you're telling me even 1300 years ago, we were very polarized. There is one form which is going ahead with like uh, the Tantra side. And then there is another which is becoming even more socially restrictive for women with the Dharma Shastras. So in India, this would not be called polarization. They would call it complementary. One needs the other. And this is the difference. In the West, the idea of monotheism exists. Only one idea can exist, left wing or right wing. So there's a tug of war. Indian thought will say both are valid ideas in different contexts. That's the difference. There's a fundamental difference that everything has a value. There is no poison in this world. In the right place, poison becomes medicine. So everything has value. Right. So this concept like um, and is something that we have to understand. This is a very Indian way of thinking. Western model is clash, conflict, revolution, fight. This is what you see today. Those right wings and the left wing activists, the right wing politicians, all these guys, they are always fighting all the time. And that's a very colonized way of thinking. It's not an Indian way of thinking. Indian way of thinking is everything has a place. Kali has a place. Saraswati has a place. Lakshmi has a place. Durga has a place. Everybody. So the West will look at images. Oh, Lakshmi is sitting at the feet of Vishnu. That's patriarchy. Kali is standing on top of Shiva. That's feminism. Now, this kind of linear thinking is rubbish because they'll say, no, Kali is Lakshmi. Lakshmi is Kali. Now, how do you explain this to the West? They get completely confused. They say, no, no, they're two different ideas. No, they're the same ideas. That's the difference. Right? If you listen to tantric poetry, they will say, Kali one day got bored and she said, I want to become a man. And I want to become, so I'll go down on earth and become Krishna. And then Shiva says, if you are going down as Krishna, I will follow you as Radha. So now you have gender transformation happening. That's very interesting. How do you explain this to the Western mind? And how do you explain to left wing, right wing activities that it's not as simple. It's not this clean divide. It's not an Excel sheet. It's just merged and everything will keep emerging on its own organic way, which which is, you know, if you're a control freak and, you know, if you're insecure, you're controlling. If you're controlling, you want to order things and you don't like, you want to control everything in this world. And that's a sign of insecurity. While a secure mind will be comfortable with Kali in her context, Saraswati in her context, Lakshmi in her context. So all goddesses and gods have a place. So that's, that's, that's how you explain all the contradictions that seem to baffle everybody else who's trying to kind of understand a lot of our legends. Um, so you were talking about Kali standing on Shiva. I think that's something that becomes the most iconic imagery of Kali. So you, earlier we were talking about cha, the Chamundi image, this layer of Chand and Mundarakshasas. And at what point do you see this image of Kali as we know it emerge where she has her tongue outstretched, her hair unleashed and putting her foot on Shiva? And, and what's the right way to understand all the things that we see her, her nakedness, her, the, the blood on her tongue, her foot on Shiva? How, what's the right way to interpret this? Image? So A, there is no right way. The moment we use words like right and wrong, we are becoming more. I, reg I regret it the minute I said it. I was like, with David, I should not have said that. Yeah, because you see, that's a, the moment you use the word right and left, it's immediate colonization. That's the indicator of colonization. I am, and that's the ego talking, really. Not even colonization, it's the ego. In India, they'll say, this is ahankar. Because there is there is no one way of, that's why art, art and is never going to have one image. It's going to, even it's metaphorical, right? Even words are not one thing, right? So we have different meanings. Metaphor is something that people don't, have to understand. So when you're showing a woman, what are we explaining? We're explaining nature. In typical mythological terminologies, the goddess is visualized as nature. Nature is not out there. Our body is nature. This body that you and I have is Kali and she has her own form. And uh, um, we domesticate our body. So we cover our body, we comb our hair, we you know, dress up in a particular way to appear civilized in society. That is Gauri. The Gauri has taken over. We have... Uh, take an agency on our body to control it. Now, the story goes that once upon a time, there was a demon who could reproduce himself by if a single drop of his blood fell on the ground. Now, this story is repetitively told in many Purans and 
there are many versions of it. There's no one version of it. Again, be very careful of comic books and people telling this one version. There are many versions of this. Sometimes Shiva is fighting them. Sometimes Kali is fighting them. But the fact is this Asura basically is Rakta Beach. Every drop of his blood turns into another. And therefore, the gods invoke a goddess who can prevent this blood from touching the ground. And that goddess is Kali, whose tongue is outstretched on the battlefield. And she drinks this blood and she prevents reproduction. She produce, she does not let the same thing happen again. She doesn't. So let's imagine you keep making the same mistakes again and again and again. You keep in your relationship, you do the same thing again and again and again. Then Rakta Beej has infected you. And because you are not able to stop yourself, so you'll pray to Kali that please spread your tongue and get this negative habit of mine out of my system. So it's a habit. It's a habit. I keep doing these stupid things again and again. How do I, somebody has to stop this reproduction of this Rakta Beach, right? And that's what Kali does. Or for example, let's say a fight is going on and you're seeing two people fighting and you're telling them, you know, keep quiet, just keep quiet. Don't, don't retort because the more you retort, the more the argument will go out of control, which means control your tongue, hold your tongue. Sometimes silence is more powerful. That's what Kali, those stories are representing. How do you not let things go out of control? How do you not let things go crazy? And a stereotype around women, not just in globally, that women have loose tongues or, or women can't control themselves, their desires, whereas men are projected to be composed and con in control. So, so I want to ask, like in this iconography, is this like uh, kind of challenging that, like her by pulling out her tongue, is she saying that like, no, I will not be silenced? See, mythological imagery is not to be gendered. They are explaining ideas. So Kali doesn't represent a woman. She represents the body. She represents nature. Shiva doesn't represent a man. He represents the mind, which is lo located within the body. So mind has no gender. Body has no gender. But when I'm communicating, I need to create characters. When I create characters, I have to give them gender. And in mythological vocabulary, the female form is used for the tan and the male form is used for the man. And man or tan saath mein kaam karte hai. So this idea of the mind and body working together is explained through male and female forms. The problem is our mind takes things literally. And I'm, we're trained to see things literally. Just as in a poetry, if somebody says, I uh, rode the sun you know, and um, you know, I swam through the ocean of milk. Now, are they referring to reality or they're trying to communicate something? But then is this image showing body over mind? Is that the idea being conveyed? It is telling the mind that without the body, you're nothing. So the mind is lying there and saying that, you know what? Think about it right now. Let's say you want to drink water. Right? Your mind is saying, drink water, drink water. Can you do anything without moving your body? So that's what, uh, that is what Kali is telling, that your body is important. So if your body has desires, you better satisfy it. How much of the desire you want to satisfy? Then the body says, no, no, but I have gone out of control because, you know, I may keep wanting to drink water and then I want to drink alcohol and then I'll go crazy. So the mind says, you know what? I can even pull you back. So this conversation between the mind and the body, this tension between the mind and the body is the tension between the God and the goddess. It's as simple as that. They're trying to explain. Some people use Sanskrit words. Some people use artwork. So the same idea which they're saying through Sanskrit, complex Sanskrit words is being communicated through art, through stories. And in art, when I create a character, I have to do male or female. So then they did a decision. Okay. When I'm discussing the body and the nature and things tangible, I will use the female form. When I'm explaining the mind, the sensations, feelings, which are more intangible and abstract, I will use the male form. And that's what they did. And there are many reasons for this. The art, you know, that's you'll do a session on how art works. But this is, you have to understand it from the point of view of art and not give it simplistic ex explanation. Oh, this is a feminist image. This is a patriarchal image. These are Western, you know, it's leaving the of, right wing, you know, foolish people. What do you make of the, the story, very common story among, well, I guess most normal, most uh, middle class Indian people, well, at least I'm thinking of my background. <laughs> But um, the, the story that she discovered that it was her husband, Shiva tries to rein in Kali and comes lays in front of her and Kali, when she realizes she's got her foot on her husband, the tongue, outstretched tongue is more a sign of a Bengali uh, shame, Lajja. 
how do you see that is that like a patriarchal interpretation of things yes who would have told the story would it be a man or a woman um, naturally a man and it's a very common story whoever was telling the story got a lot of success in popularizing his story yeah because you see me- stories that make men the wick you know women as evil will always be successful right it's always because in a patriarchal society that which what will work so we have to step back and there'll always be foolish people in this world and we don't have to indulge foolish people uh we have to decide whether we want to listen to such rubbish uh because uh, there are stories where uh, not mentioned in ancient texts this kind of a story i have whether it, even if it appears in ancient texts ancient texts talk about women being burnt alive in their husband's funeral pyre doesn't make it okay right ancient texts talk about uh, you know certain men have the right to learn sanskrit and certain men don't have the right to learn sanskrit so just because it is ancient doesn't make it right you and i atma is resides within you atma resides within me which means what does it mean it means i have the capability to evaluate the ca- things for myself i don't need a guru ji to tell me whether it's right or wrong a book to tell me what is right and wrong a social media post to tell me whether it's right and wrong you and i have the ability to look at things and try to understand them and appreciate them that's what atma means that and therefore we have to look at art and understand it in our terms and how we would like to read it and what makes sense and it may not make sense to others others may make another sense of the same artwork which is also valid which is perfectly valid and that is what we the moment you try to give it one meaning then you are born then ego has come up the ego is saying that you know what there only one meaning can exist and while i hear these stories this story is not more than 15 6 17th or 18th century is the first documentation of the story in bengal it's not there remember that the the goddess has stories in odisha so have you heard an odia story like this have you heard an assami stories like this why only a bengali story and why in 17th century bengal because that's where the british are coming british establish themselves after the battle of plassey and they are telling the bengalis explain yourselves explain yourselves um and the bengalis are like oh my god how do we explain things that we can't really articulate we just worship we don't understand these things and the british are like you better explain it to us you savages and they come up with these strange explanations but odias didn't do that and the Beng- assamese people didn't do that and the biharis didn't do that and the tamilians didn't do that so why should a bengali story dominate the world so when the british came tantra was still quite prevalent in bengal even though it had sort of like fallen out of popularity in many parts of the country it was still um quite uh, mainstream in bengal so there are certain things that now tend to shock us when we talk about tantric practices especially around worshiping the devi one of them being the use of the panch makara and then many people ex- well let me just first of all state it out there the use of madhya which is wine mamsa meat matsya fish mudra grain and mathuna sexual intercourse and this is clearly shocking for anybody especially in context of worship the way we think of devotional worship today so my my question to you is like were these things literal when they're mentioned in tantric texts that these things were used in worship was that literal or was that symbolic or the symbolic explanation came again when the britishers were asking how the hell are you doing all these things and then people said no 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 we don't do any of this it's all symbolic well um everything is symbolic you know why do why does the queen of england carry a handbag when I mean, there are staff who can pay for her money why does she carry a handbag all the time does she have money inside it you know what is symbolic why do you wear a crown it's an absurd thing on the head it's a symbolic thing why do you wear a crown i mean it's an absurd idea um you know why do um, you know indians uh, not wear um, dhoti kurta so clothes are symbolic when you wear jeans you have a different meaning when you wear so symbols are part of human life there's nothing wrong in having that's how we communicate with each other so step 1 let's get that out of the way second is we are embarrassed what's wrong with alcohol what's wrong with meat what's wrong with fish mudra can mean anything from dead bodies to gold to grain so we really don't know what the word mudra means it can also mean language uh, it can mean so many things over there seal it can mean a seal so uh, property therefore mudra can mean property so it can mean material things and then uh, madira alcohol so everything um, you know food you know this world of um, alcohol money um sex meat fish what's wrong with any of these things why are we embarrassed about it and this embarrassment is what people feed on right people are feeding on it's like looking at a gay person and saying oh why are you gay i'm like 
your case. So what is the big deal? Why are you getting so hysterical about it? Nobody's hitting on you. So this is the hysteria which is born of insecurity where we have to explain ourselves. Nobody has to explain their lives to anybody, especially if they're not trespassing on other people's rights and privileges, right? And therefore, we should first ask ourselves, what's wrong with it? If people have sex and drink and alcohol, that's what you do in every party, right? That's what you do in a party. But party is not life, right? You have party for a few hours, then you come back to a different life. And therefore, life is always going to be a journey between Veda and Tantra, one which indulges the senses and one which withdraws from the senses. You know, Monday through Friday, you go to work, go to the gym, you're having a proper diet, you're working hard and you're trying to be very, very nice. And then maybe Friday night, you go out and open yourself up and you have drinks and, you know, you want to take some chemicals. Some are allowed by law, some are not allowed by law. Alcohol is allowed, but taxed. But, um, you know, marijuana is not allowed. So there are people, because we want to break free from this tight world and we want to do something new. And that can also be toxic and dangerous and destroy you completely. Just as too much of control can completely wipe you out and destroy you and give you a nervous breakdown because you have not taken a holiday for a long time. And this balance between the Veda and the Tantra is just the balance between work, weekday and workday uh, and a weekend. And that's what it, this scripture is saying that, you know, you can't live a cloistered life all your life. You need to open up. You can't be opened up all the time. You need to come back. And this cyclical thing is what they're talking about. Now, in the 19th century, they didn't know how to explain this to white guys because they were, they were being defensive. You and I don't, uh, we don't have that. I don't have to explain myself to a white guy or to right wing or to the left wing or to a feminist. I don't have to explain myself to anyone. Um, you know, so I, and that is what we have to understand. These are practices in India. It's like asking, you know, why do you go on a pilgrimage to Hajj every year? Why don't you go to some other pilgrimage spot? But that's their practice. It's a Muslim practice. So you can appreciate the shock value, right? So, for example, like a lot of people, let's say, for example, in Delhi or Mumbai, they would eat meat, they would go have alcohol, but they would at the same time go vegetarian and stay away from bars during the Navratri. The fact that these are the days of the goddess makes it, they, those are the days become when you renounce all of that. And then to see that the goddess being worshipped with those very substances creates that uh, sh puzzlement or bafflement. This among is those. the ego. No, The ego thinks what it doesn't know doesn't exist. Right. Right. So this, you're, you're seeing the ego at work. And this is the fun with ego, right? Ego thinks it knows everything and is shocked at what is the right way to live. Somebody tells you this is the right way to live. You know, is the ego talking, not the Atma talking. The Atma will never speak like that. The Atma will be like, you know, you figure it out yourself. You figure it out yourself. But this desire to control others is the ego at work. And, the and it's a very interesting uh, explanation given that we're talking about Kali who in one hand has a severed head representing ego and another sword, which is... That's what she's saying. She's like laughing at you and saying that she's sticking out your tongue at ego and saying that you foolish person, I'll cut your head off. You know, I'm going to eat you. I'm going to chop you alive. What will you do? I know what is going on in your heart. I know everyone who's saying, oh, these things are bad. I know what you do at night. I know how you treat your wife and I know how you treat your daughter. And I know how you treat your... In all Hindu temples, there will be an image of Kirti Mukha with the tongue sticking out, not just Kali. Because the gods know you are lying. They can see through the mask. They oh, know so. that you are pretending to be... You know, all those people, who just because you wear white clothes doesn't mean you are a good person. You're not a generous person. Um, you're trying, you know, the fact that you want to control other people is the ego at work and the gods know it. You can't fool the gods. Okay, there's something that I, I don't know if this has already been discussed in other forums, but something that always comes to me is so many legends around the goddess Kali or Durga or Shakti it have these two demons that the goddess is slaying. The story of Chanda Munda or Madhu Ketab or Shum Nishum. Then there are just so many of these kind of there's one that I had not heard about, but I found it recently, Kolasur and Gorasur. There why what is is there some significance of those two demons, the twin demons that the goddess is slaying? Or it, what's interesting is that you're so comfortable with slaying. Well, because we think the demons are evil, so she has to slay them. And violence is good. So we always justify violence by saying the person I'm killing is evil. Right. That's how we justify violence. And violence is justified by saying that other thing is needs to be killed. And that's, but you see, that's what we're seeing. And the moment, it's not that it's Chanda or Munda or A and B or C and D, the act of killing 
is to be paid attention to because we are somehow associating violence with power. But violence is about realization. But violence can also be about wisdom. Who are you killing? Chanda and Munda is, the goddess is killing you. Chanda and Munda is the devotee who is being killed, whose arrogance is being slaughtered and massacred. The arrogance is being massacred. Ignorance is being massacred. Stupidity is being massacred. It's not the villain out there. It is the stupidity in you. So the greatest villain in this world is our own stupidity. And that is the problem that we deal with because he's inside us and like a puppet master playing us. And that's what the goddess is reminding us of. And so this act of killing is what we have to ask ourselves. The moment the goddess is involved in a sexual act, it bothers us. The moment she's act in a violent act, we seem fine with it. And that's what happens in Bollywood also, right? So long as the hero is killing people, we love it and we let our children watch it. But the moment the hero kisses someone, we'll say, nahi, bachon ko nahi chahiye. we are perfectly fine eating vegetarian food and watching men killing each other. And I'm like, really? I eat vegetarian food at home, but I want my child to see people being bashed up and all those video games are our violence. But the moment I bring sex into it, intimacy into it, love into it, it becomes evil. And that's what Kali is watching and smiling and laughing. And she's like, look at these people. They claim to be vegetarians and non-violent, but they love violence. They love blood. And I'm sticking out my tongue and dancing naked in front of them with a weapon in my hand. Let's see what they look at. Do they see my nakedness or do they see my violence? Because both are there in, front, in that image, right? The image has both violent imagery and sexual imagery. And really, what is offending people? What is yeah, offending? That's what puzzles me. I think it's not, the, you're absolutely right. I think it's the sec, when the sexual aspect becomes prominent, that's when we see so many people it getting on. the same image of a male god. If Bhairava is also naked, Bhairava is also disheveled. He's also holding a weapon and he's also got heads and bodies on him. That form doesn't offend us. But the moment the woman becomes naked and she's fighting, we get offended by the female as when the female is violent and naked. But when the male is violent and naked, we seem to be fine with it. And that's the thing. Why is the female nakedness and violence disturbing? And why is the male nakedness and violence okay? And this is what the goddess is laughing and she's sticking out her tongue at the hypocrisy of the observer. See, we are all little darshan karo, darshan karo. Or Bhagwan ka jab darshan karte, when you look at the demon, uh, at the deity, be on top of the deity, there is a demonic face. It's called Kirti Mukha. And it has always a tongue sticking out. In many ways, it is an image of Kali, you can say. It's Kirti Mukha standing there and telling, you know what, all your piety, I can see inside your heart. I know what's going on. You can win a debate on national TV, but I can see what's going on inside. I know the truth. Fascinating. Um, look, I think this is this is it's been one of the most enlightening enlightening conversations for me. There is so many insights that my mind's like exploring right now because you're telling me every single way in which I think it's all linear, it's all wrong. I need to expand. It's kind of like telling somebody that you're running like a simple algorithm and you need to apply artificial intelligence to bring about to capture all the non-linear relations here. But but I think. It, just the recognition itself is a huge step forward and thank you so much for that it's it's been it's been terrific thank you so much David. i hope to have you with us again in future on so many other topics that you can enlighten us on whether it's art or philosophy or and so much more thank, thank you, you.